Hello, welcome back to the series on uh, the mathematical foundations for classical political economy. Today I'm going to be introducing functions and uh, in particular I'm going to be discussing uh, more profoundly linear functions and I'm also going to be giving a really nice application to an economic question regarding the wage profit curve uh, implicit in the standard uh, Schraffian system of prices of production. Okay, so with that being said, let's start with the first uh, important question, which is what are functions? Okay, before we start talking about linear, nonlinear functions, it's important that we know how to define functions. And functions are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, binary relations. They are uh, rules that, given two sets uh, of uh, values of elements, in this case we have a set X and a set Y they associate, okay, in the case of a function from x to y, they associate these functions, elements of x only, okay, so with each element of x, only one and exactly one element of the set of values y, okay, and only one, this is really important. So, in this context, x is the domain of a given function, so x would represent all the values uh, of the variable x in, in this case and y would be the codomain so this set of values would be the codomain and uh, within this set of values okay all of the values of of this set that are associated with the elements contained in the set x are what we call the range of the function now formally we can express functions as uh, this initial uh, uh, expression here where uh, we can see that this function basically is telling us that we are, uh, uh, again, uh, this is a function from x to y, okay, from the set of values x to the set of elements y. Now, we can also express it, and this is the more common way, as y being a variable and x being also a variable, as uh, y as a function of x, which is expressed here as f of x, and uh, this holds true for for all, and this uh, connector here is uh, in formal logic, uh, it's a for all connector, which tells us that this function holds true for all the values of x, of the variable x, that are contained within the set, okay, of all of these values, which is again uh, x. Now, uh, the range of the function can be expressed formally as this particular expression, and what this is basically telling us is that the range is the uh, set of all the values of y within the set of values of, of, of this y, for which it is true that uh, this function holds true uh, for all of the values of x within uh, this set x. Okay, so as we were saying before, is uh, all of the values of y that are associated with all of the values of x. Okay, now one important and really crucial concept within functions that we need to understand and that I see people even at higher levels of mathematics uh, that don't really understand is that not all equations are functions, okay? Functions, as we are seeing, are very specific and they have a very specific definition that excludes many equations uh, from uh, taking part in this particular uh, definition. Now, one very nice example that I like to uh, present all the time is the example of the unit circle or pretty much all other circles uh, which uh, the equation for the unit circle would be x squared plus y squared equals to 1 okay so in this case this expression tells us all of the points in the Cartesian plane where okay the distance from those points to the origin is 1 this is basically what they tell us now we can rearrange this expression to put it uh, to put y in terms of x and we can see, if we do this, that this is not a function because for each value of x that you input here, the output is going to be two values of y, okay? So if we input x equals to zero, this is going to be one minus zero, one, and the square root of one is one. So the solution, so y is going to be equal to plus and minus one for x equals to zero. So as we can see, we inputted one value of x and we obtained two values of y. So this is not a function because as we were seeing before, functions, the input is one value of x and the output has to be exactly one value of y. Okay? Now, we can also see this graphically, why uh, the unit circle, for example, is not a function, although it is an equation. 
uh, expressed as uh, as I expressed it before. Uh, graphically, it can be seen perfectly well uh, because if we say, for example, x equals to zero, okay, y is equal to either one or minus one, for example. So in this case, we do not have a function. And for each value of x within this range from minus one to one, we can see that there are two values of y. And the same goes the other way around. So even if we reverse this relationship, x is not going to be a, a function of y either, okay? Because for each value of y, there are two values of x. So noting this, uh, let's now, uh, uh, let's now uh, consider what linear functions are, okay? Now linear functions can be defined uh, within two uh, general contexts and they have uh, different definitions within this context. Con, uh, within these uh, different contexts, although they are they resemble each other uh, to some extent. Now, within the can the calculus context, okay, we can think of linear functions as polynomial of first degree or of zero degree. Now, what it means uh, for something to be a polynomial of first degree is that the variable is basically elevated to the power of one. Of zero degree is that the variable is elevated to the power of zero, which any number elevated to the power of zero is equal to one. By the way. So uh, this would be uh, what linear functions are within the context of calculus and their graphs are straight lines. That's why they are called linear functions. Okay. When we graph them, they look like straight lines as I'm going to be showing next. Now, this is the formal definition of a linear function within this, within this context. And this is the general expression actually of uh, a linear function. Now we see that Y here is what we call the dependent variable okay because it's the variable that uh, represents the outputs as you input uh, numbers into this variable which is x which is the independent variable and this not and these uh, definitions are important also for linear regression and uh, we can see here that uh, y is a function of x and this particular function takes the form uh, alpha, which is in this case the uh, slope coefficient, I'm going to be uh, defining now what it is, times x plus beta, which is the intercept, okay, the intercept, uh, and I'm also going to be defining what this is next. And this function holds true for all of the values in uh, of x, basically they are contained within the set of, of, of values within the domain of x, okay. Now, um, we can define formally uh, uh, the slope coefficient by taking, for example, two points, okay, any two points within a linear function, and uh, these points that I decided to take to, I decided to represent them as x1, y1, the first point, and x2, y2, the second point, okay, and we can subtract, okay, uh, the expression of this function for this point from the expression of this function for the second, for this uh, first point, okay, and we can obtain from this subtraction what the formal definition of the slope coefficient is in this following way, okay? So y2 minus y1 would be equal to the subtraction of this part for x1 and for x2. So in this case, we have alpha times, so the slope coefficient times x2 plus beta, which is going to cancel out with this other beta, so it doesn't play a role here at all, minus alpha times x1 plus this beta, okay? Now, if we do this, if we take this subtraction again, the betas cancel out and we have y2 minus y1 equals to alpha times x2 minus alpha times x1. If we rearrange a little bit more, okay, and algebraically we can do this, we can say that alpha, okay, we can take out uh, here an alpha and leave this expression as it looks like this, okay? So y2 minus y1 equals to alpha times the subtraction of x2 minus x1. Now, now we can define, now we can represent uh, this uh, differential here as the increment in y, which is denoted as this, where this uh, small triangle here uh, represents the increment, okay, of y, and the same for the increment in x, okay, this subtraction is the increment in y, this subtraction is the increment in x, and we can represent this in this particular fashion. Now we can divide both sides by the increment in x, and here it would cancel out, and in here we would have basically the definition, the formal definition of the slope coefficient, which is this one. It is the ratio of the increment in y to the increment in x. Now, when we look at derivatives, 
uh, especially for complex functions, we are going to be looking uh, more in uh, in detail at uh, what uh, the slope uh, co uh, what the slope coefficients look like. And uh, uh, well, in this case, this is a linear function, so within the context of derivatives, we wouldn't call it like that. But uh, when we look at the derivatives, uh, all of this is going to make uh, far more sense, uh, even in functions that are far more complicated than linear functions. Okay, so the slope coefficient is the ratio of the increment in y to the increment in x, okay? And then the beta here is the intercept, which is the value of y when x is equal to zero, okay? So it's called the intercept because it's when the, uh, the, the line, so graphically, when the line intersects with the y axis, okay? Now it intersects when x is equal to zero as we're going to see next. Now, within the context of linear algebra, we can think of linear functions as a linear fa as a linear map, okay, a linear function as a linear map. And in this context, we define, okay, a linear function as having two properties, okay? Now, within the context of, of uh, systems theory, uh, this, uh, uh, this particular property would be called uh, superposition, and this one would be called uh, homogeneity. And what this basically tells us is uh, this x and y here are elements of a vector field, okay, so they are vectors, and that's why they are represented here in bold, uh, because they are vectors. I'm going to be discussing these concepts more in particular, what vectors are and so on and so forth, when I talk about linear algebra, but uh, for now, you know, you, you just have to bear with me uh, in case you don't know. And what this basically says is that the function of the sum of two elements within a vector space are equal to the function of one element in this vector in this vector space uh, plus okay so the addition of this function plus the function of the other element of the vector space okay this superposition and then we also have another property which says that if we scale a vector and we take the function of that vector it has to be equal to the scaling of the entire function okay now, uh, when we look at linear algebra, uh, we will be discussing uh, this uh, with far more detail. So for now, you know, you just need to get the, the basic gist of what this looks like. And some examples of linear functions are uh, the ones that we have here. OK, so uh, and I'm also going to be showing you how you could uh, graph linear functions. So in this case, we have y as a function of x is equal to three times x plus five. So in this case, five would be the intercept and uh, we can see already from the very beginning that this is the graph that represents this particular function graphically uh, because y is the intercept, so because five is the intercept and it is the value of y when x equals to zero, which is the same as uh, what we can see here. If we input zero here, it's going to be th three times zero, it's zero plus five, so it's five, y is going to be equal to five, and this would be a point of this function, okay? Now, we can see, okay, that what the slope coefficient here tells us is that for an increment of one in x, so if we increment x from zero, if we increase x from zero to one, the increment is going to be from five in, 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 in y, it's going to be from five to eight. Okay, so it's going to be an increment of three. This is what basically uh, this slope is telling us. So we can graph this basically by taking two points. We can take, for example, the point, as I was saying, zero, five, and the point one, eight, and we can draw a straight line passing through those points, and this is how we would graph a linear function. The same goes for this other example, which says that y is a function of x, and this function is x plus 20. Very easy to graph again. We have the intercept is 20, so when x equals to 0, y is equal to 20, and we have that the slope is 1. So what this means is that for an increment of 1 in x, the increment in y is going to be of 1 as well. Now, what does this mean? If we take two points and we draw a line passing through them, we get this particular line here. Okay, in this case, going from minus 40 to 40, but uh, if, if we don't specify here a range for a, a domain, then basically the domain is going to be the entire uh, a, a real line. So it's going to be the entire set of values from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? Uh, because we're not specifying here the, the domain. So we could take it to be from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now we can do a little, uh, something a little bit more complex, which is uh, uh, here, define a function where we do not ex specify explicitly the slope coefficient, 
but we do give you, uh, for example, we do get the function, the graphical uh, representation of the function, and we need to find what the slope is from the function, from the graphical representation of the function. Now, in this case, we can do this very easily. First of all, we note that, this, that the intercept is 10, so we can already get a first point here, which is 0, 10, and we can also take a second point from the graph, uh, in this case, 1, 12, OK, so x equals to 1, y equals to 12. And we can, using the formal definition that I used before of the slope coefficient, we can basically take the ratio of the increment here in y, which is 12 minus 10, to the increment in x, which is 1 minus 0. And this increment basically is 2. So this ratio is 2 over 1, which is 2. And this would basically be the slope uh, coefficient, which would tell us that the function this function in particular is y is equal to 2 times x plus 10. Okay, and this is the graphical representation of this particular function. Now, having noted all of this, we can uh, use uh, these concepts of uh, linear equations and their slopes and so on and so forth in order to uh, apply them to a given concept within classical political economy. In this case, within uh, the Sraffian okay, uh, uh, additions to classical political economy, because Sraffa was not an economist, Piero Sraffa was not an economist of the classical tradition, but he did a lot of work uh, based on this tradition, and uh, he's a very, very, very prominent economist who wrote a, a highly respected book, which is called Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. And in this book, basically, uh, he, he defined a system of price of production where, okay, the standard wage profit curve implicit in this system was basically a linear one. And the reason why it was linear is because Rafa uh, did not consider wages, did not include wages as part of the stock of capital advanced in his model of price of production, uh, which is something that the classical economists and Marx certainly did not do. And that's why the standard wage profit curve within their model, within their system, is nonlinear. Okay. I'm going to be discussing this particular curve within the Marxist classical system uh, in the next video because as being nonlinear, okay, I'm going to discuss it when I discuss nonlinear functions. But since we're looking at this Raffian one, which is linear, we can see that it takes the form, okay, of the wage profit curve basically uh, tells us it's a function of the wage as a function of the profit rate. And uh, what this tells us basically is that the wage as a function of the profit rate, which here is denoted as pi, is takes this particular form that anyone that has studied Rafa knows what this is all about because uh, you know this is really really popular uh, description here which is 1 minus pi over pi max and what is pi max is the maximum rate of profit in that economy and pi is the homogeneous rate of profit in, in, in an economy okay and this pi here is a variable if we, if we take it to be a variable uh, and this is not a variable so the maximum rate of profit can be uh, solved for uh, and I'm going to be discussing how you can solve for them when I look at these systems of prices of production uh, in the future. And I solved, for example, uh, using the standard uh, classical Marxist with a pure circulating capital model, I solved for the maximum rate of profit in the Spanish economy for the years 2010, 2015, and 2016. And for that, you need to solve an eigenvalue problem, which, uh, again, I'm going to be discussing more about that in, in future videos because this is uh, higher level mathematics that, of course, is more complex than this. So uh, now I'm just going to be saying that you take, okay, arbitrarily this maximum rate of profit, but you can actually get this with empirical data uh, by using, uh, by employing a certain set of computations. Now, uh, so pi here is the rate of profit. Now, normally, uh, as Rafa defined it as R, so he, instead of pi, he used r, and he used a uh, uh, higher case r for the maximum rate of profit. So he used lower case r for the rate of profit and higher case r for the maximum rate of profit. Uh, but it doesn't matter, really, so long as we are defining the same things. doesn't matter what symbol you use. And I decided to express this uh, same expression here in a different fashion so that it would be a little bit easier to see what the slope and what the intercept is within this context, okay? So here we can see that if we define, if we rearrange this a little bit, we can see that the slope coefficient in this uh, function is minus 1 over the maximum rate of profit. And what this minus tells us is that wage decreases as the rate of profit increases. Okay, so this is a relationship that 
uh, makes a lot of economic sense. Okay, that as the rate of profit increases, the wage of the wage rate decreases, and it decreases by by what amount? By one over the maximum rate of profit. And uh, we have that the slope, uh, sorry, that the intercept coefficient here is one, which means that when the rate of profit is zero, the max so the maximum wage rate is 100%. So it's one 100%. Okay, so all of the value goes to the wages. All of the value added goes to wages. Now, uh, now we specify, okay, that this the range of the rate of profit has to be from zero to the maximum rate of profit. Okay, this is uh, what how the variable behaves. Okay, the variable behaves as uh, increasing from zero to the maximum rate of profit. Now, what is the slope? Again, the slope is the ratio of the increment in wage to the increment in the profit rate, and this increment, uh, this ratio is one minus one over the maximum rate of profit. Okay, which is negative, which tells us that uh, this function decreases in the space wage profit rate. Now. We can take an arbitrary value of uh, the maximum rate of profit, okay? So, of course, it has to be from 0 to 1 for it to be economically meaningful. And the one that I decided to use was, for example, 0 0.9, okay, an arbitrary one. But if we were to graph this without considering uh, the economically meaningful uh, definition of this function, we would see that this would be almost how it would look, okay? How this graphic, uh, so how this function graphically would look. So in this case, for example, the range, uh, the the domain of of the rate uh, of the rate of profit is from minus five to five, okay? And this is the line would look like this. But of course, this doesn't make uh, economic meaning. This doesn't have any economic meaning because uh, there are no, uh, there cannot be any any profit rates, you know, of minus five or of five. Okay, so this is why this would be a representation of this function if we did not say that the rate of profit has to move from zero to, to the maximum rate of profit. Now, in this case, we do have the economically meaningful graphical representation of the Sraffian standard wage profit curve, which basically uh, tell us, tells us okay, that uh, this is a linear function, it is a decreasing linear function, and the rate of profit moves again from zero to the maximum rate of profit, which I said was 0 0.9 or 90%. And uh, the range of this function, so wage, goes from zero to 100%. Okay, and it decreases, and the slope of this that defines this uh, decrease is minus one over the maximum rate of profit. So one minus, so minus one over 0 0.9. Okay. So having noted all of this, uh, this is one application of linear functions. They also have many applications to linear regression and many other concepts. And they are really simple, so they are also highly popular, you know, within certain branches of economics to define certain things, certain simple relationships between two variables. And when I discuss, okay, uh, multivariable calculus and multivariable functions, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, linear equations with respects to more than one variable. But in this case, we're looking at single variable functions, and we are talking about single variable functions because we only have one independent variable, which is x, and, and we of course have one dependent variable, which is y. Now, if we had more than one independent variable, we would be speaking about multivariable functions. Since we only have one, we are talking about single variable functions, okay? And these are the ones that I'm going to be using more frequently uh, in these videos before we speak about more complex uh, uh, calculus. Uh, with regards to the multivariable version of calculus, okay? Now, having noted all of this, I uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. Uh, hopefully you learned something from this discussion. If you have any questions, you can always uh, ask me in the comment section. And uh, with that being said, uh, I will see you in the next video.